Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and today we're going to talk about the seventh trumpet judgment in Revelation 11. But before we jump in, if you missed the last video, be sure to go back and watch it. And if you're new to the channel or you're interested in Bible prophecy or you've always been fascinated by the end times, then you've come to the right place because I've been teaching through the entire book of Revelation and there's a lot of great content on our channel. So after you watch this video, I encourage you to visit the channel and while you're at it, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video post. You know, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of people view the book of Revelation as that other book of the Bible. You know what I'm talking about. And they don't give it equal standing with the rest of Scripture. But the book of Revelation is as vital to us today as it was to the early church. And I'm convinced that it has always been God's intent for believers to understand the book of Revelation. I mean, it wasn't designed to confuse people. In fact, Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And according to 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion. And even further, according to 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable or beneficial for instruction, for conviction of sin, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped unto every good work. See, this is the thing about God's word is it's living and it's active. It's a moving, breathing word because it's spoken by his living breath. Now, I want you to notice that the Bible says that the scripture is God-breathed, not was God-breathed. See, God's word always is because it's being carried on God's eternal breath. And according to Job 34, now I know that's everybody's favorite book of the Bible, but according to Job 34, the Bible tells us that if God should determine to do so, if he should gather to help himself his spirit and his breath, that all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust, which is effectively saying that God's word is so important that if he gathered his word, everything would perish. Yet at the same time, every word from God is saturated with the breath or with the power of his life. In other words, every promise, every admonishment, and every prophecy from God has in it the true essence of life, and without this living word, we have absolutely nothing. Now, my point is that as Christians, I believe it's incredibly important that we give the book of Revelation equal understanding, I mean, equal standing with the other books of the Bible if we're going to be thoroughly equipped unto every good work the way that God wants us to be. Now, this is a great place to jump into our topic for today. Uh, for context, and let me just give you a little bit of back context for where we are, because we're, uh, we've been moving through the book of Revelation, and we've been talking about what the Apostle John saw as he was transported through a spiritual doorway into the throne room of heaven, as he heard a voice saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place. Now, after this, he sees the Lamb of God take a hold of the seven-sealed scroll, which immediately triggered one of the most dramatic scenes in all the Bible as the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and multitudes of angels spontaneously burst into praise, declaring, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. After this, we witness the emergence of the Antichrist, the opening of the first six seal judgments, and then after the sixth seal is opened, God, in his incredible mercy, stops all judgment for a season and removes the spiritual blindness from Israel, supernaturally raising up 144 Jewish evangelists to preach the gospel. Now, these 144,000 come to the Lord through the ministry of five angels. And these, these uh, evangelists or these witnesses 
bring about an incredible revival in Israel among the Jewish people, as well as a massive harvest of souls from around the world. Which brings us near the end of the first half of the tribulation and the opening of the seventh sealed judgment, which is the catalyst for the first four trumpet judgments, which devastate a third of the world's vegetation and water supply, and then to make matters worse, a third of the sun, moon, and stars goes dark. Now, as the fifth trumpet sounds, the bottomless pit is opened and Abaddon is released and a horde of demon locust hybrid type creatures ascend from the bottomless pit to torment the world for five months. And as the sixth trumpet sounds, the four fallen angels who've been bound in the Euphrates River are released to prepare an army of 200 million horsemen and through their war, a third of the remaining population on earth end up dying. Now, which brings us to the interlude between the sixth trumpet judgment and the seventh trumpet judgment, which pretty much covers the entire second half of the tribulation. And it's during this interlude that the Antichrist takes up residence in the temple in Jerusalem, declares himself to be God, and sets himself against the Jewish people in a genocidal demonic attempt to wipe them off the face of the earth, which marks the beginning of the Great Tribulation or the second half. And at the same time, though, that the Antichrist takes his stand in the temple and declares himself to be God, God in turn sends two witnesses who are given incredible spiritual authority and supernatural signs to stand against the Antichrist and his followers and continue witnessing to the world for Jesus Christ. Now, in fact, their ministry of these two witnesses spans pretty much the entire second half of the tribulation, at which point a beast ascends out of the bottomless pit and kills them, leaving their dead bodies in the streets of Jerusalem. But after three and a half days, God raises the two witnesses from the dead, and as they stand up, the voice of God calls out to them, and they're caught up to heaven in a cloud with literally the world's news and media stations broadcasting all of it and the whole world watching. And within an hour of the two witnesses being taken to heaven, a massive, massive earthquake hits Jerusalem, killing 7,000 people. Which brings us to our text for today, beginning in Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. Now, Revelation eleven fourteen says this. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. Now, within the seven trumpet judgments, there are three woes that are more severe than any of the other judgments, and they bring about incredible torment and affliction on those who follow the Antichrist. Now, if you remember, we've taught on this, but the first woe takes place in conjunction with the fifth trumpet judgment, and it involves the demon locust from Revelation 9 who torment unbelievers with stings that cause so much pain that those who've been attacked long for death, but somehow God suspends natural laws and he doesn't allow them to die even if they try to kill themselves. Now, the second woe is part of the sixth trumpet judgment and involves the releasing of the four fallen angels who've been bound by God in the Euphrates River. Now, after which these four angelic principalities raise an army of 200 million horsemen who kill a third of the earth's remaining population. And the third woe is connected to the seventh trumpet judgment. Now, let's go back to our text picking up in Revelation 11, verse 15, which says this. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, this is a lot to take in, and you can't help but feel the significance of this judgment as the angel declares that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. I mean, what a declaration, and we know that it's all been coming to this, right? But this passage represents a massive, massive spiritual shift. 
Now, a lot of modern translations of the Bible use the word kingdoms, but the more literal translation uses the word kingdom, which actually makes more sense and provides us with a powerful contrast. See, the spiritual battle that's been raging since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden is not for the kingdoms of the earth, rather it's a battle for the kingdom of the world. And while this might seem like a subtle distinction, there, the difference is absolutely massive. Now, if you remember back in the Gospels in Matthew 4, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days by Satan, if you remember, the enemy was perfectly willing to give up the kingdoms of this earth, talking about nationalities and governments and regions in exchange for Jesus bowing down and worshiping him, knowing that he would retain control of the kingdom of the world, which is really an incredible thought. And I don't want to get sidetracked off of what we're talking about but it tells us how incredibly real Adam's dominion over the earth was before he forfeited it through sin. I mean, think about it. Even though Jesus rebukes Satan by saying, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only, he didn't, uh, in spite of the fact that he, that he rebuked him and spoke the word, he didn't question the validity of Lucifer's offer. Even further, for it to be a real temptation, I mean, wouldn't it have to be something that Satan could actually give to Jesus? My point being that this seventh trumpet judgment brings the whole world face to face with the power of the cross and the victory that Jesus Christ won on it. Now, what we're talking about is incredibly important, and if you miss it, you pretty much miss the essence of the book of Revelation. See, the prophet Daniel talked about this when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream as he describes the consequences of the kingdom of God taking over the earth. Now, check this out. Daniel 2, uh, beginning in verse 44, says this, And in the days of these kings, and it's talking about those who are ruling in the very last days, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. Now, Isaiah describes this day in Isaiah 9, 6. It's a very common passage of scripture, but you may have never seen it in this context. It says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government, the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it. Now look at this. To order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And I recognize that this passage is most commonly used at Christmas because it says, for unto us a child is born. But the point of this passage is that this child will inherit the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world and that he will establish his reign through judgment and justice, which is exactly what Jesus Christ does at his second coming. Now, Colossians 1, picking up in verse 15, says this. He is, talking about Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And... He is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all these things he may have the preeminence. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is about his sacrifice and him gaining the preeminence over all things. 
meaning that because of his work on the cross, all of God's power and might are completely represented in Jesus Christ. And since Jesus is both eternal and incarnate, since he is the essence of creation and the firstborn from among the dead, he's been given absolute lordship over everything, and there is no dominion or principality or power that can stand against him. And because of this, he will consume the kingdoms of the world and establish his eternal throne. See, this is the gospel message. This is the message of the kingdom. And the Bible says that this message of the kingdom needs to be preached in the whole world. And that as it's preached through the world, that then the end will come. Now, let's move on in our text in Revelation 11, picking up in verse 16. It says this, And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying this, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. So as the voices in heaven declare that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, uh, the 24 elders fall on their faces and they begin to worship God. Now, there's a lot of debate, and I've heard some very complex arguments surrounding who the 24 elders are. But I believe that the context of where they are is extremely significant. Remember, John is standing in the throne room of heaven in the very place where creation, salvation, and the kingdom find their source. And because of this, I believe that these elders represent, and they're representing the collective body uh, uh, of Christ, the collective people of God, and his workings from both Old and New Testament times, which leads me to conclude that the 24 elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. But what an incredible picture of what it means to truly worship God. See, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet judgment and the declaration that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God, all the 24 elders can do is fall on their faces overwhelmed by the greatness of God and give thanks in a spirit of absolute humility and surrender, lifting up the greatness of God. Now, I believe this is something that we need to remember in the body of Christ today. See, I think that we have lost many times in our own minds and in our own hearts the greatness of God and the fact that Jesus Christ is exalted and he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And as we see these things, as we see these things in Scripture, it should inspire us to surrender our lives in humility before the Lord and worship him because of his greatness, because of his power, and because of all that he has done and because of his work on the cross. Now, let's continue in our text, picking up again in Revelation 11, verse 18, which says this, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Which is fulfillment of what the psalmist said, in the second song concerning the battle of Armageddon, said this, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointing, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision, then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them with his deep displeasure. Now, what an incredible contrast in our passage from Revelation and the corresponding passage and the connected passage uh, to it in the Psalms. It's an incredible contrast in that evil men in their high places and their nations rage against God in their wickedness. But their anger and their wrath are in vain, 
and they're powerless against the holy anger and righteous judgment of God that's going to be poured out at his return. There's nothing they can do to stop it. There's nothing they can do to hinder it. There's nothing they can do to lessen it. They're all going to stand before him and they're going to face judgment. See, we're talking about the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ and that in the fullness of time, he's going to reward the righteous, he's going to vindicate every wrong done against them, and he's going to judge the wicked. And all of this is because of the victory that he won at the cross. And on that day, on the time that this passage comes to pass, the words of the prophet Isaiah will also come to pass. Isaiah 11, beginning in verse 3, says this, His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with the righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall sway he shall slay the wicked. What an incredible passage. Now, let's finish our text. Revelation eleven nineteen. as all of these things have been happening, this passage ends with this. It says, then God's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and earthquake and a severe hailstorm. If you remember, the Ark of the Covenant was given to Israel in the Old Testament as a sign of God's covenant with Israel, and it represented the authority and government of God in connection to his covenant people and his promise to bless and preserve and to keep them. But the Ark in Heaven's temple represents uh, uh, all of God's eternal authority and his eternal government that was established through the new covenant that Jesus Christ brought about through his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. Now, here's an interesting passage that talks about this in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. Listen to this. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. So he's talking about the tabernacle in heaven. And Christ came not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. See, it's all about Christ and his work on the cross. It's all about his redemption of this world and the desire that everyone who would call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, let's stop there for today. But before you go, I would love to pray a prayer of blessing over your life. Now, in the Old Testament, God commanded the high priest Aaron and his sons to bless his people. And God declared that as they spoke his name over them, that blessing would come on them and be literally become a wall of protection over their lives, that his favor would destroy every curse and that his favor would break every work of the enemy and that they would be free to prosper and free to live lives of blessing. And I believe that same blessing belongs to you today. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And Father, we thank you, God, that we have all these things because we ask them in the very name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, and we say, amen. Well, God bless. And I look forward to seeing you next time.